وسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضع من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضع من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد فالقائد أعلى المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Verily all praise is due to the Almighty Allah We seek his forgiveness Besiege his blessings We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us To salvation To light And eternal joy Bliss and happiness Insha'Allah ta'ala today we Originally were planning to have A Q&A but seeing The majority of Brothers and sisters are attending and my belief was that the majority will be in their compounds, their villages due to school holidays. So we will inshallah have probably about an hour if not less or a bit more of a continuation of Kitab al-Tawheed and then inshallah ta'ala we will enter the entertainment of Q&A Not your Q&A but my Q&A uh, I will ask the questions of previous lessons that we have taken in order to re... you can say strengthen and stabilize and reaffirm that which was taken from the start of this year until now بإذن الخالق عز وجل and I am pretty sure تبارك الله being the students of truth the lovers of حق you all have revitalized and re-energized yourselves Islamically by refreshing your memories with the revision of the declaration of salvation so insha'Allah ta'ala without any further delay we initiate by saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to humanity he sent him at a time where his people the entire globe that he was living in at that time were living in darkness innovations evil, mischievousness and wickedness so Allah Ta'ala sent him at a time where the people that he was surrounded with and abroad were living in a state that no Muslim no human being would accept ethics and morals were at its lowest so they were in dire need of the message of salvation he found his people worshipping all forms of deities the stones, the trees he found them worshipping stars the moon, the sun he found them worshipping angels the jinn, man all forms of deities that were carved by their own very hand with what? from wood and stone to the extent where if one of them got hungry he would eat his own God 
as the hadith mentions, gods that were created and made from dates. So when one of them got hungry, he would actually eat his own god. This was the ignorance that they lived in. And even dogs will urinate on their god god gods, and yet they would not feel anything towards it. Still worshipping it after a dog had urinated on their false evil deities. He found his people calling onto these gods, onto these deities, invoking them, taking refuge with them, seeking their assistance, beseeching their benefits, slaughtering for them, vowing to them, using them as mediums between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kufr and shirk in essence. Likewise, he saw his people consulting soothsayers, fortune tellers, magicians, sorcerers, maltreating neighbors, spreading immoralities. He found his people severing bonds of kinship. He found his people dealing with unlawful transactions, and that was rampant. Evil upon evil, mischief upon mischief, corruption upon corruption. This is, was the era that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, before revelation, he was living in. And then Allah ta'ala, the Almighty, sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a shining star, shining light, as a beacon for all his people and beyond to the last second of this earth. What did he actually call his people to? What did he call humanity to? Because his message is universal. His message was the last message, was it not? Absolutely. So what was his message built on? What did he really teach? What was the essence, the core, the pinnacle of his message? Nothing but La ilaha illallah. Tawheed. He taught people, he called people to the testimony of salvation, to the declaration of worshipping only Allah. The only God, the only deity worthy of worship. That was his essence and the essence of his call. And he continued to do so until Allah the Almighty took his blessed soul away. But when did he go? When did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam actually leave this world? How did he part this earthly existence. When did he go? Only after he taught man everything that he needs to get him into Jannah. To get him close to Allah. And he warned us likewise from everything that will get you close to Jannah. He did not leave one single thing except he taught us. That which is good he taught us, and that which is bad he warned us against. Did he leave a will? Yes. In your Kitab al Tawheed, that is before your very eyes. Hadith Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, we're still in chapter number one. He says, Whoever wants to see the will that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam placed his seal. He seal, in other words, he certified it. He endorsed it. Let him recite the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Surah Al An'am, verse 151 to 153. And it's in your books. Say, so come, and I will recite to you what your Lord has forbidden for you. Allah tushriku bihi shay'a, the first thing 
the first thing on that will that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions join not anything in worship with Allah you want salvation you want successfulness you want to attain the everlasting eternal bliss of gardens and joy simple easy the will is very before your eyes join what the first commandment the first commandment for every single human join not anything anything not minor not medium not major nothing no matter how minute it may be join not anything in worship of Allah number two and we're gonna have a look at that inshallah briefly each one number two be good and dutiful to your parents. Number three, Do not kill your children because of poverty. Subhanallah. You know how they used to kill their children because of poverty? <laughs> Allah says, don't kill your children because of poverty. And look at the next phrase. <laughs> we do not only provide for them, but we provide for you and them. Which testifies and signifies that the provider is who? Who was the razak? The father? The mother? No. The boss? The foreman? Your employer? No. is no other than the magnificent, the creator. Your risk has been written the day that the soul has been blown into that womb. So don't think today that you come and you can change that. Whatever has been written has been given by the Almighty Allah. So Allah Ta'ala is saying to the parents, in particular to the pagan, ignorant, evil, wicked, mischievous Arabs. Don't kill your children. Leave them. Leave them. Don't be scared or afraid of poverty. We provide for you, O oh parent. And likewise, we provide for whom? The children as well. So do not fear poverty. We Muslims do not fear poverty. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam feared not poverty. When the man came and grabbed him by the neck, he was a kafir at that time. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, give me from that which Allah has given you. And he gave him a whole herd of sheep. You know, someone's grabbing you by the neck and say, give me what you've got. You want to probably retaliate. Not correct. You would want to retaliate. But Rasulullah did not retaliate. This man of ethics and morals, of excellent character and manners, he said, take that herd of sheep. When that man saw the character of this beautiful person, he said to his people, La ilaha illallah. I have been to a man that is not scared of poverty. And all that tribe became Muslim. So fear not poverty. We provide for them and for you, as Allah Ta'ala says. Number four, Do not come near Al Fawahish, shameful sins, sexual promiscuity, illegal sexual intercourse. Whether openly or whether hidden. You know, many people today, they think that when they're alone, in secret, inconspicuously, they open that net. My wife is not around, my mother is not around, my father is not around, my children are not around, no one's around. I can play and browse as I please. One example out of many examples. But the reality of the matter, Allah is around. Do not come near al-fawahish, Allah says. The fourth prohibition. 
Do not think that when you're online, that you are alone. Do not think that there's no one in the room with you. Wallahi, Allah is with you. Seeing, hearing, recognizing everything that you are doing. And he says to us, do not come near al-fawahish. Do not go near shameful sins, illegal sexual environments. So when you go on the net, and inshallah we don't do this because we're Muslims. But those that do go on the net believing they are all by themselves, Allah is warning us from this. Allah is warning us. So think not that you are allowed to browse and surf the net when it comes to sexual behavior. For Allah the Almighty Lord, you want salvation? You want happiness? Know that Allah knows and sees exactly what you are doing. If you've done it, Alhamdulillah, you're a human being. You're weak in essence. Your nature is deficient. No problem. What do you do? Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. No problem. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever forgiving, ever merciful, ever gracious. The all repenter. He accepts your repentance as long as your repentance is sincere. But fear not. For indeed every single one of us here does mistakes. Every one of us here has undoubtedly been affected by the opposite sex. So when Allah Ta'ala says, do not come near fawahish, He's warning us to be very careful. Be patient. For Wallahi, what is coming is better for you. More lasting, more purified, more clean, more hygienic. So be patient. And for indeed the people of patience will get that which they intended. So if we have committed any of these, these evil, shameful sins, not a problem. Not a problem. Alhamdulillah, we're human beings. We're not perfect. Allah created us like this. But repent. Before we leave this earthly existence, repent. Number five, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْبَاكِ Or number five, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Kill not the soul that Allah has forbidden except in just cause. In other words, according to the Islamic law. Don't go outside and inside and start killing as you please. He's a murderer. He's a person that does evil. He's a rapist. He's, he's, he's. And you take the law into your own hand. You know, as one brother in uh, Islamic University, he read the verse, uh, kill, kill the pagans, the polytheists, wherever you see them. And he believed wholeheartedly that you must kill every pagan wherever you see him. So this person, after university, after he graduated, he wanted to go back to America, he was an American, Afro-American, and start killing the pagans. We said, Ya Akhil Aziz, be careful. Islam is not telling us to go and kill. Or the Quran is not telling us to go and kill every pagan that you see, just like that, absolute. No. You gotta understand what the verse means, the revelation, the reason. Why? He believed that go and kill every polytheist, anyone that commits shirk, he believed you can go and slay him. Is that correct? Would you do that? That means you have a big job on your hands. Leave America out, let us look in this country. You have a big, big job on your hands. You know, I've just moved to a new area called Denkel. And I've been hearing the Hindu, Hindu garbage that's been going on for the last five days. I've had some celebrations or whatever of the new God, Maha or Baha or Haha, I'm not sure. And they're singing and yahooing and clapping and evil above evil. If we want to adopt this verse, 
<laughs> as this person believed, you will be working 24 hours non-stop. But it is not what he understood. We are not allowed to kill any soul as we believe ABC should be killed. No, that is up to the Amir or the Khalifa or the Hakim, the judge to rule this. And in Islam, there are those that are allowed to be killed and we shall inshallah look at that very briefly in our coming lesson inshallah ta'ala. Number six. وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا مَالَ لِيَتِيمِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ حَتَّى يَبُلُّغَ أَشُدْهُ Do not come near the orphan's wealth unless you want to strengthen it, perfect it, enlarge it, increase it until they attain the full strength. Number seven. وَأَوْفُوا الْكَيْلَ وَالْمِزَانَ بِالْقِسْتِ لَا نُكَلِّفُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا When you give measure, when you give justice in a scale, Allah Ta'ala says, give full justice, give full measure, give full scale with justice. We do not burden anyone except that which he can bear. You know, today for example, when you go to the shops and you ask for a kilo of apples, or tomatoes, or cucumber, or what have you. The dealer sometimes wants to play games with you. And he plays with the scale. He may give you 900 grams when you ask for a kilo, and he charges you for how much? One kilo. Is he allowed to do this? Is he allowed to do this? This is haram. And by doing this, he has burgled you. He has stolen you, and Islam is a deen of justice. Justice. And a person who does that has been oppressed, whether he knows it or not. And on the day of judgment, he will definitely know that he was wronged. How would he know he had? On the day of resurrection, how would that person know that he was wronged? How? Huh? Because everything that a person does is recorded. And on the day of judgment, oppression is darkness. Every single person that was oppressed on this earth knew, Wallahi, your right is secured. Your right is there. And Oppression is darkness. For the oppressor on the day, for the oppressor on the day of resurrection. Even that 550 grams or 0 0.01 gram, 0 0.01 gram, if a person did it deliberately, he will be judged and accounted for on the day of judgment. And likewise, you see people, you might go to the shop now, and you want five meters of carpet. See, it's not only on the scale. You might want to go to the shop and buy five meters of carpet. But the man gives you four meters and 90 centimeters. 4.9 centimeters. Four meters, point nine centimeters. And what is that? Is that acceptable? You ask for how many? Five meters. Can you accept that as a merchant? By charging him five meters, when he demanded five meters, and you say, no, 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 I'll give you 4.9, but he doesn't know. He, doesn't, he does not know. I know, he does not know. That is again haram. That is not giving full scale or full weight in justice. And inshallah, we'll have a look at that very briefly again. Number eight. وَإِذَا كُلْتُمْ فَاعْدِلُوا وَلَوْ كَانَ ذَا قُرْبَى When you give your word, speak the truth. Even if a near relative is concerned. Even if a near relative is concerned. يَا أَخْوَةِ الْعَزَّةِ Is there anything better than speaking the truth? Really, wallahi. How nice is it be known to be known that this person is truthful. You can trust this person. 
Is it not a character you want to be known for? Truthfulness is light. And when a person is truthful, Allah Ta'ala loves him. And he will command all the angels in the heavens to love him. And then Jibril will put love for him on this earth and be known as a truthful person. You know, sometimes we overlook when it comes to our friends, our cousins, our relatives, you know, our near kindred in any shape, manner or form. We try to overlook their problems. We try to overlook when they do mistakes. We try to hide uh, their lies. So when you give a testimony, you know that this person's committed evil. But what do you do? You give a false testimony in order to? To protect your cousin, your friend. It is halal. Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَوْ كَانَ ذَا قُرْبَى He reiterates it, reaffirms it, that when you're giving your word, speak the truth, even if it means a near relative. So never, ever give false testimony. And one of the minor signs of the hour is the spread of false testimony. Look at it today. People lie. People lie. People buy judges, barristers, lawyers. Big dollars today. It's a big business. The evil get away with crime because of the corruption in the system. In Islam, there's no corruption. In Islam, there's no evil. In Islam, it's just. That's why one of the seven that will be judged and be shaded on a day of resurrection when there is no shade except the shade of Allah Ta'ala is whom? The just ruler. So you can see that a just ruler who gives his word in truth under any circumstance, he will be inshaAllah Ta'ala shaded on the day of resurrection by the shade of the Almighty Allah. Number nine, وَأَوْفُوا بِالْعَهْدِ Now, fulfill the covenant. The covenant here is the very essence of our creation. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man, what did he engrave on every single soul? What did he engrave? The fitrah, the natural disposition, the innate nature, the natural belief, the inclination of faith on every single person that will be alive on this earth before we were created. This has been engraved on our souls. This is the covenant that Allah Ta'ala is telling us that we must fulfill the covenant between ourselves and whom? And what is the covenant? What is it? What is the fitrah? What is Islam? To worship Allah alone. This is the covenant. This is the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, commands us to fulfill. Number 10. وَأَنَّ هَذَا سِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلُ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ and this is, that was the last of the commandments. This is my path, my straight path. So follow it. What was the path is he referring to? Huh? And the straight path. And what was the commandments and the prohibitions that came before that? In other words, he's saying, this is my way. This is the straight path, so follow it. And do not follow other paths. Be warned, be careful. Don't deviate. Don't divert from the straight path, for they will separate you from his path, from Allah's path. And then he says, Allah Ta'ala, ذَٰلِكُمْ وَصَّاكُمْ بِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّكُونَ All this, he has commanded you, ordained for you. Why? To look and read and put it away. To say, Tabarakallah, MashaAllah, what a beautiful commandment and prohibition. And close our eyes 
and close our hearts. What was the reason why? He mentioned this. Two? Two? Exactly, for righteousness. Maybe, it may be that you may attain righteousness, piety, Allah consciousness, awareness. You may awaken from your slumber. This is the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these commandments. This is the reason why Allah ta'ala has prohibited A, B, C in order that we attain Allah consciousness. That we fear Allah ta'ala and we apply it. So this series of verses begin by informing us that which will be recited to us, that which will be recited to us, which is in the verses, will raise your level of Iman, will raise your level of Taqwa, will raise your level of faith, will raise your level of Islam and Ihsan, when? When you pay attention to it, when you implement it, when you succumb to it, when you take it by the hand and love it, and devote your life to it. And you walk with it every single day of your life. And wallahi, this will raise your iman. This will definitely raise your taqwa. You want to be good Muslims? Do you really want Islam in your life? Do you really want happiness? It's simple. Adapt. Just these Ten Commandments. And you know, the scholars have said that these Ten Commandments are similar to what? To? Nazvi? To what? Yes, very good. Similar to the Ten Commandments of the scriptures of Moses, Musa alayhi salam. And in reality, they are very similar. Major resemblance. Because who was Musa? MTS, who was Musa? Was he a normal layman like us, Joe Blow? Who was he? Well, who was he? He was a messenger of Allah Ta'ala, yes. So every messenger was sent what? What was he sent? A big teddy bear or a small teddy bear? The laws, the legislation, the commandments, the prohibitions. In order for us to understand who Allah is. What Allah wants from us. Not to look, read and put it away. The Quran, you put it on the shelf, on the wall with beautiful material. And every time you enter the house, mwah, 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 mwah. That's not the Quran. The Quran is used for what? Not in the material on the wall. Decoration new. No. Place it in front of your eyes 24-7 and look at the commandments and apply them. Look at the prohibitions and abstain from them. Read the history of Islam in the Quran. Read the news of the future in the Quran. You want genuine authentic news? Don't go to CNN or Foxtel or BBC. No. Go to where? Where? The glorious, uncreated, noble, sacred word of the Almighty. That is the beautiful and the best news. It is genuine, authentic. From the most authentic, pure, truthful speech. Allah Ta'ala Himself. But again, we are always so brainwashed by the glitter and gold of this dunya and we forget and we forget believing in false images of satellite images of a false Jannah and forgetting that a real Jannah exists being brainwashed by the glitter and gold of this dunya and forgetting the glitter and gold of Jannah this is our problem we want to make millions and millions and millions when we can make billions and trillions and no limit in Jannah. Then would you want a trillion dollars? Would you want it? I wouldn't mind it to give you something there, yes. But would you want it in reality? No. Why? Because it can destroy you. But do I want a trillion or unlimited amount, unlimited digital in Jannah? Yes, I do want that. I'm greedy for that. And if you want that, as I said to you guys before, right. 
on your foreheads. When you wake up every morning, I want Jannah. What do you write? I want Dunya. No. I want Jannah. When you wake up in the morning, when you sleep at night, write, I want Jannah. So what do you do? You occupy yourself with that which leads you there. When you want to go to a travel, certain distance, uh, beyond your residential area, what do you do before you go to sleep that night? You pack your bags, you get ready. Likewise, we are getting ready. We are traveling to Jannah. And you say, I want Jannah. So what do you do? You pack the bags as well. You prepare the food, the drink, the clothes, the actions that will get you to Jannah. It's simple. So these commandments that Allah Ta'ala has told us, He told us for a reason. In order that we implement this law, these commandments. You know when you're sick, where do you go to? To a mechanic? Where do you go to? When you're sick, who do you go to? You know, you've got a severe flu and you cannot bear it anymore. Let's say a toothache, because most people flu are a bit more easier. A toothache! And it's so painful. That nerve is kicking in. It's overwhelming you. The passion is killing you. What do you do? Do you go to a fruitologist and ask him for an apple? To cure your toothache? What do you do? You go to a dentist. And usually, the dentist will push you away to make more money, that is. Whoever look at it the first time he sees you, and say, oh, you've got to come back, and you've got to come back, and you've got to come back. For what? To make more money. It's, it's business. They want you to get sick so you can come to them, you see. Doctors, professors, specialists, whatever you want to call them, dentists. They want you to come back. Otherwise, they're going to be broke and bankrupt. So they want you to be sick and not healthy, in reality. So, what does the dentist give, to you, give you as well? What does he give you besides treating your, your ache? What does he give you? Every dentist, every doctor. What do they usually give you before you leave? Huh? Drugs? Does he give you the drugs? Was he a drug uh, trafficker, is he? What does he give you? He himself goes and gets it from his box and gives it to you? So what does he do? He gives you a prescription. And what's the prescription got on it? You can tell me. What does a prescription have on it? You can't hardly read the doctor writing anyway, most of the times. But what does the prescription have? Think! It has? It has the so-called cure. The idni al-khaliq azza wa jal. Correct? Medicine. It's got medicine. Take this at this time. Don't take it at that time. After food. After when you wake up. And, 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 and. Do you take this? Why do you take it? Why do you take it? Muhammad, what do you take the medicine for? Recover. To recover from what? From sickness. You don't want that pain, do you? SubhanAllah. Allah has given us a prescription as well. Has He not? A prescription from what? From the fire. Very good answer. Allah has given us, wallahi, a prescription from the fire. From the evil, damnation, the abyss of tormentation. The prescription is before our eyes. We just read it. This is a prescription. Is it not? Prescription from what? A toothache or a heartache? From? From Jahannam, a'udhu billah. And that will be a severe ache, believe me. So the prescription is before our eyes. Why do we not open our eyes to this prescription? Why is it then, when we feel pain, we want that pain to be cured immediately, but because we can't see hellfire, we delay it and delay it and delay it. Imagine you had a toothache today, and you cannot bear the toothache, right? The pain. So you are given this medicine, you immediately rush. Wallahi, you even break your fast. And you are allowed in this circumstance to, to cure or relieve that 
pain. The pain is there if you do not take this prescription and fulfill it. And the pain will be everlasting in eternal. So make sure we look at these commandments as what? As a prescription from? From Jahannam. Let us look at the first one. Do you want to enter today the, the actual categories or you want to do Q and A? Would you like to enter? Allah <laughs> tushiriku bihi shay'a. The very first of the prohibition, the commandments. Join not anything in worship with him. In subhanallah, Islam is the deen of salvation and light. If you look at the reality of this message, of this deen, it is the only religion that places the greatest stress the greatest emphasis on what? On divine unity. No other deen, no other path, no other ideology, no other doctrine or dogma, no other way, methodology, syllabus, curriculum, way of life, places the same emphasis as Islam does. Because Islam in reality is total submission, surrender to no other than Allah, worshipping him alone and Allah Ta'ala does not tolerate that partners are associated to him or anything is worshipped instead of him this is why in Islam it does not tolerate or compromise with polytheism with paganism with trinitarianism with idolatry with imperialism colonialism secularism liberalism socialism communism modernism and any other satanism out there why not why not why does Islam not tolerate with anything called modernism why you can tell me because exactly you are ascribing a partner with Allah, because modernism, which today in reality is Americanism, what are you actually doing? What are you doing? By saying that we need to modernize this deen, which is pure in essence, beautiful in its core, when we say that we need to modernize, liberalize, socialize this deen, what are you actually saying, Nazdi? Uh, Very good essence of shirk. You are actually saying that the law of Allah, Allah who is the legislator, the lawmaker, the law giver, is not good enough. And you need something else besides it. Some other entity, some other factor, some other faculty, some other branch, which is taught. This is exactly what you're saying. So all these isms I mentioned refer back to kufr and shirk because whoever wants to change the sacred code of sharia is in reality causing an addition to Allah's law and causing an addition to Allah's law is a kufr in Islam and a shirk in Islam which is in tawhud in essence subhanallah drinking alcohol killing an innocent soul with a murder, homicides, rape, disobedience to parents, burglary, riba, zina, corruption on earth, all these are, yes, horrifying, dreadful, evil, wicked sins, are they not? But shirk, my brother, beloved brothers and sisters, shirk, my brothers and sisters, outweighs all these sins accumulated that word should that one sin that one word outweighs every single sin that exists on the face of this earth why and you know shaitan he wants you to believe 
that there is nothing worse than committing like zina, fornication, whether adultery or not married zina, or committing riba, or murder, or homicide, or rape. He would want you to believe that this is the most dreadful, horrifying sin. Why? Who can tell me why? This two-horned, ugly, deceiving beast. He would want you to believe that those sins are worse than all sins put together. Why? Who can tell me? Uh huh. You getting there? In better words, correct. In better words, he wants to divert you. And look at this Ummah today. Look at the Muslims. They're so interested, which is good, but not good enough, in keeping away uh, from haram food. Halal, 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 halal. No problem. Acceptable. But when it comes to the most important creed, Tawheed, they are so ignorant. They go and do grave worshipping, invoking this, and they do this, and they do that. But they're so strict with halal, 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 halal. This is not Islam. <laughs> look at that which is more important before you look at that which is more lesser than that. And this is exactly what shaitan wants you to think. That this is the worst. Because when a person commits shirk, he denies the very purpose of his existence. Shirk undoubtedly is the greatest act of injustice against Allah. What is it? The greatest act of what? Injustice against who? Allah. Oh, against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ini subhanallah brothers and sisters, everything may be forgiven. Everything. Killing, rape, burglary, riba, zina, disobedience to parents, everything may be forgiven except shirk. Why? Because it goes against the very covenant that we made with Allah before our earthly existence. It betrays a fundamental aspect of human nature. What is our human nature? What is human nature here? Who can tell me? What's human nature? What's our human nature? To? Tawheed. Tawheed is our human nature. The fitrah. So when we commit shirk, we went against our human nature. And this is the evilest thing you can do. And this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has every single right, because He is our maker. He is our owner. He is our fashioner. He is the magnificent. He is the one that blessed us and gave us. He has every single right not to tolerate polytheism. Not to tolerate partners ascribed with him or worshipped instead of him. He has every single right. And shirk is unforgivable. Is unforgivable. Is there proof for shirk being unforgivable? Is there proof? Is there proof? Where? Which encyclopedia? Einstein's collection? The Quran. The Quran. Is there an encyclopedia of the Quran? Absolutely not. In Surah al Disa, verse 48, what does Allah Ta'ala say? Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika li man yasha wa man yushrik billah Indeed, Allah forgives not. This is Allah's words now. Interpretation of the meaning. He forgives not that partners are ascribed with him. But anything less than shirk he forgives to whomsoever he pleases. And then he says, whosoever ascribes partners with him has invented a tremendous sin, evil. In Al-Ma'idah, verse 72, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ 
Whosoever worships the partners of Allah Ta'ala, Allah has forbidden for him, listen carefully, has forbidden, forbidden for him, Jannah. And the fire will be his abode. And the wrongful doers, the wrongdoers, will find no helpers on that day. You know, how many friends have you got here? How many friends have you got? True friends. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, a hundred. No friends? How many friends have you got? True friends. About five, huh? For example. Do you think those friends, on the day of resurrection, they're going to save you from hellfire if you are admitted into it? Inshallah, you will never even get close to it. But would you think, on that day, yeah, Ahmed, please help me. Alfred, John, Cassandra, please help me. I ate with you. I drank with you. I enjoyed ourselves together with you. We went clubbing, nighting, this and that together. Please help me. And the rondos will find no help us. The only help you will get is from the mercy of Allah Ta'ala. And the only reason that Allah bestows His mercy on that day is what for? Due to what? Ziyad. What was the reason? Or what is the reason that Allah bestows His mercy on the day of resurrection? On a believer. What is one of the reasons why mercy can be achieved? Okay, but why do we receive Allah's mercy in essence on the day of resurrection? Who knows? That's it, our actions. The covenant, the commandments, the prohibitions. We are doing it for no other than Allah. So Allah Ta'ala, those who are sincere in their covenant, He will bestow their mercy on Him. They have mercy on them. What, you think we enter paradise of our mercy? With our actions? By these two rakat that we do every day and night? They're nothing! That's only a reason to achieve the mercy of Allah. Because it is through Allah's mercy we enter Jannah. And not our actions. Do you understand that? It is not our actions independently that we enter Jannah with. It is through Allah's mercy that we enter Jannah. Do we understand this point? But the only way we achieve Allah's mercy is through our sincere actions. Is there a problem with that, Nazim? You sure? I can see you flying around. Huh? So you did you land the helicopter? Okay, alhamdulillah. And likewise, in the Hadith Al-Qudsi, it mentions an authentic narration. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am no need. Before that, he says, I am so sufficient. Look at these beautiful words. This is Hadith huh, that Allah says, I am so self-sufficient that I have no need for a partner. I have no need for a partner. And then he says, whosoever doesn't act while intending someone else's sake with me. So there's the act of worship that someone does it for someone else with him. He says, I will renounce that action to whom he ascribed to me or with me. Do you understand that? In other words, anyone that doesn't act not for Allah's pleasure, not for Allah's sake or countenance, Allah Ta'ala will reject that act to him whom you ascribed with Allah. So on the day of resurrection he will say, go to him whom you done the act for. Did you get that? Did you understand that? And again I repeat, today's Ummah is extremely in a sad situation. All due to one thing, the lack of Tawheed. This is why you see Tawheed or Shirk per se is extremely manifested in innumerable ways. 
manifested. How many people excessively glorify the righteous, bowing, lowering themselves, belittling themselves for human beings and not for Allah. And I'm pretty sure you see this. You know, when you see, the, for example, in this country, the Datos. Is there a company called Dato, correct? Yeah. Dato. What else is there? Uncles. What else? Tanko? Tonko. What else is there? A so many names. What else? Tansin. What is it? There's uncles, there's tankos, there's datos. What else? Skibitsi. Tansri. Whatever other Bansris. You see, for example, photos, you've got Tunku, Tanka, Tomba, Dato, then name of the person. Yeah, he's just a human being. Why elevate yourself? Why place so many titles before your name? What, are you different from this person because he's a poor person? Or his rank is not like your rank? Are you better than him and you're not better than him? Inna akramakum Allah, inna akramakum inda Allah who? The best of you in the sight of Allah is those who are righteous. So it's not proper to put this, 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 then Abdul Razak, Ibn al Hajji, Ibn Qadr, Ibn Qadr. But you got five, six, seven titles before the name. This is not Islamic. This is not Islamic. Then subhanAllah when the companions or the kuffar, when they call Muhammad Sallam, what do they call him by? Rasulullah or Muhammad. Ya Muhammad. Not Ya Qadr, Duhi Kaba, Dubi Daba, Muhammad. No. No such thing. Ya Muhammad, Ya Abu Bakr, Ya Uthman, Ya Sayfullah, Ya Khalid, Ya Ali, Ya Abu Talha. No, today if you aren't called by these names, they get angry and they feel bad. They feel like you're belittling them, disparaging them, humiliating them. Why? You are my brother. Kafa halak ya akhi. Wallahi, I myself met one of these Dato Bato Hatos. And I said to him, كيف حالك يا أخي? He looked at me in a sort of frowning way. Because I did not say that or whatever other names that there is before their title. And this guy is a righteous person. We think of him best. But he was upset with me because I didn't name him or stand up for him when he came in the room. I only stand up for Islam, no one else. I only lower myself or bow down to Allah, not to a human being. I don't care how many Dato names you have. I don't care how Malik or Prince or Amir you are. I lower myself only to Allah and no one else. I respect you with full dignity and integrity, yes. I love you for the sake of Allah. You're my brother, you're my sister. But I do not put you higher than us. You're equal in the sight of Allah Ta'ala and the best of us are those who are most righteous. So to want to be called that, and to be preferred to be called that, and to obligate others to do that, is an act of disobedience to Allah. You are not even allowed to stand up for a person in Islam. Did you know that? You are not allowed. And the hadith says, whosoever stands up, or whosoever desires others to stand up for him, let him prepare his seat in hellfire. Hadith Rasulullah, authentic hadith, wallahi. What does it say? Whoever desires that others stand up for him, let him prepare his seat in hellfire. So imagine wanting to be higher and desiring that and commanding this from others. We are equal in Allah's sight. Islam is justice. It's beautiful, it's perfect. We men have destroyed it, tarnished it, tainted it, dirtied it. Us human beings, by wanting other than Islam in our lives. So in Islam, don't ever you, O oh human being, O oh Muslim, O oh slave of no other than Allah, don't lower yourself to another human being. Lower only to Allah Ta'ala. Bow, lowering. Only to one, and that is Allah. Even this action, sorry to say, I don't want to offend the Malaysians here. I hope you're not offended by my statements. We're trying to learn something, inshallah, is Islam. The purity of Islam. So if I was in South Africa, I would do the same thing in accordance to what they do. And they do a lot more than you guys, believe me. 
likewise in the subcontinental or in the African region in totality. So here in reality it's minor compared to other countries, wallahi. Let alone the worst of the worst, the Arabian Peninsula is worse. It is the most devastating, disastrous problem when it comes to this issue. You cannot even see the so-called, what you know is Adat or the Amir there, or the leader or the Imam. You cannot even view him to that extent because you are not equal to him in any shape, manner or form. But you, brothers and sisters, don't lower yourself. Don't bow down only to Allah Ta'ala. Yes, I'm not saying be in any way sort of uh, unethical to, to the recipient. No, I'm saying be a person who is just. Honor him, respect this person. He's a man or a person of integrity. But don't place him in a stance where you lower him now. That is not acceptable. Because I've seen here a lot of people and the children are taught from the time they are babies to bow down and kiss the man or woman's hand who are older than them. This is not Islam. This is not Islam. Out of respect, I understand it's not out of anything else, but don't teach this to the children. This is not acceptable in reality in Islam. This is lowering down yourself. The only one we bow down and lower ourselves to is Allah. Bowing and prostration and lowering is only for Allah and no one else. Not to any other human being. Or not to a human being or anyone. Animate or inanimate. So excessive glorification towards human beings is unacceptable. Likewise, we see a lot of swearing by other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many Muslims swear in other than Allah by your honor, by your mother's grave, or your father's grave, by this and by that. This is as well shirk. Likewise, the belief, as we had before, in omens, good or bad. Likewise, we see many Muslims going to the graves and doing what? Invoking and besieging the dead. They're dead. They're dead. What would they, or how can they benefit you? Soliciting them for help circumambulating their graves, slaughtering for them, vowing to them, invoking them, taking them with refuge. They're dead people. It's called the land of the dead. They need your dua. You can benefit them, ta'ala. They can never benefit you. It's nonsense. It's evil. As Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَقْتَرَهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ In Yusuf 106, that the majority of them believe not in Allah except that they commit shirk. And the hadith does say, Abu Isa al-Tirmizi collected it, that this ummah, groups from this ummah and the hour will not be established until we see this who start resembling the non-Muslims and have begun worshipping idols. These or those people are the ones that claim to be Muslims. Because he said groups from this ummah, from this nation, they are the ones that are worshipping idols. How? The dead, for example, human beings. Fear of the jinn and so forth. Going to sorcerers, soothsayers, magicians, fortune tellers, and other impostors who steal from the feeble, ignorant Muslims. You know how many Muslims believe in their superstitions? How many Muslims take charms off them? How many Muslims believe that he knows the unseen? This is shirk. Oh, this is shirk. And most of this ummah are committing this. And Allah Ta'ala says, Allah tushriku bihi shay'a. Join not anything in worship with him. Again, this is evil. Charms, talismans, amulets, seashells, and other objects 
that people place on their arms or their shoulders or underneath their pillow or on the walls of their homes or in their cars or in their corner of their homes in order to gain benefit or avert evil. This is shirk. How many Muslims today are committing this? Oh, this is evil. It's a violation of a person's true belief. A defect in Tawheed. A destruction in Tawheed. And this is all due to the lack, the correct understanding of Tawheed. See, many Muslims think that Tawheed is only to say La ilaha illallah and that is the end game. Is this correct? Why not? Yes. They're going to materialize, manifest that which they believe. And the only way you can perfect Tawheed is to ward off, avert, push away anything that is called shirk. That is the perfection of Tawheed. This is why today the understanding of the correct understanding of Tawheed is very, very important. It is the greatest need for mankind, the greatest treasure, wallahi. For it is only then a person can release himself from the captivity and slavery of this temporary, transitional, trivial, futile world. But if you do not know Tawheed, you will be captured and enslaved in shak, wallahi. So inshallah, we are going to come across throughout the book in chapters to come inshallah a better elaboration and clarification and illustration on the word shirk and we're going to come and learn inshallah ta'ala riya which is the minor shirk and the greater shirk because there is minor and there is a greater which is the major and we'll come inshallah and learn the differences there and that will be in lessons to come, inshallah. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Number two. Subhanallah. You know, be good and dutiful to who? To your parents. Beautiful behavior. Discipline. Affection. Gentleness. Love. Obedience to parents. Comes immediately after the necessity for Tawheed. Immediately. Which signifies the importance of whom? Your brother or sister? Signifies the importance of whom? Your parents. And this is in the majority of the verses. The first beautiful act that must be performed after refraining from shirk is be good and beautiful to your parents. Obedience to parents is an obligation, mandatory, compulsory, incumbent on every Muslim male and female. When are you not allowed to obey your parents? <clears throat> Who can tell me with some backup? Muhammad, what you say? It's against Islam that you cannot obey. I mean, if when they command you against Islam, Things that it's against Islam teaching. When they command you against Islam. Very good. What's your proof? Is there any proof? Or is it called Muhammad's proof? Not Muhammad's proof? Somewhere in the Quran. Somewhere. somewhere in the Quran? I haven't seen it in the Quran like that exactly. Which hadith is it? What does it say? <laughs> there is no obedience to creation when it means disobedience to Allah. So the only time you are not allowed to obey your parents, and I'm saying the only time, the only time is if it means disobeying Allah Ta'ala. Did you understand that? You know, today we see that the majority of Muslims, they've got fought out, they've got their own ways. They could fight anyway, they should push in. But the Muslims themselves, Allah the Muslims themselves, they have forgotten this duty. They have forgotten the importance of obedience to parents. Wallahi, many even contempt and detest their parents when they become old. There are even those wicked 
evil children who believe that they are even superior to those good two old creatures. Wallahi. How many Muslim children place themselves or deem themselves superior, better than their parents? Brothers and sisters, it's one thing. You will get old one day. You all will get old. You young men in front of me, all of you. One day. And as you sow, so will you reap. Understand that. The day will come if Allah wills and He gives you life. The way you treat your parents, be careful. You will be treated. If Allah gives you life, you will be treated the way you treat your parents. So know that you want to be, when you're old, to be treated with assistance and care and love and affection and gentleness. Not even the slightest, mildest word can be said to them. What is the slightest word? Uff. What does off mean? The slightest, most minute word of disrespect. What does it mean, off? Who can tell me? Whoever can tell me this deserves a hundred ringgit? From MTS. Intestines? From MTS. From MTS. Yeah, of course, it's always from him. Whenever I say you get a hundred ringgit or a thousand ringgit, it goes back to this person there. Here's the man with the checkbook. Checkbook, astaghfirullah. <laughs> so what is the mean of off? Deserves a hundred ringgit for grabs. Um, Yo, this guy is, mashaAllah, the better color. Uh, Abdullah, isn't it? Uh, Muhammad. Muhammad. Muhammad Rizwan. Yalla, Habibi. Uh, expression of annoyance. That's the connotation. I want the definition, where it is from, where is its roots, what is the verb. Good try. Anyone else? One zero zero for grabs. That's connotation. It's a meaning. I did not I want the verb, the root. See, subhanAllah, we know we are not allowed to say this, but do we know the definition of it? And that's the majority, yes, the actual word. The majority of the Quran, we continuously hear it and read it, recite it, but we don't even know what it means. And these words are very important because Allah Ta'ala says to you, don't say off to them. So what does the word off mean? Anyone else? It is a word of disrespect. But that's still a connotation. It's saying me, it's like a, you're elaborating on it now. Nazvi. Yes, we no. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's again, you know, explanation. No, I think I have to tell you the answer. You want to have a go? Sure? Okay. It comes from the root af. Like AFF, -F, transliterated. Or taf. T A F F. And that word means the dirt found underneath your fingernails. Not easy one, is it? Very hard, huh? Alhamdulillah, MTS, you've saved the day. You can go and buy yourself and your family, inshallah, a nice dinner, your money is still there. But see how important it is to understand these words? That's the meaning, that is the root of the word. It comes or it means the dirt that is found underneath your fingernails. But it means you are not allowed to say even this, <coughs> the mildest word of disrespect. Huh? The mildest word of disrespect, you cannot even say it to your parents. No sign of frustration, agitation, annoyance. Huh? When they tell you something they want or tell you to not do this, you are not allowed to confront them with anything that exposes a state of annoyance or a figure of sort of unwantedness. And that is haram. So our parents, we see how important it is for us to obey them. We have in the non-Muslim societies where they designate one day a year for what? 
to have a big pie, correct? Eid for the parents. Eid for the parents, mashallah. Designated to their parents as a sign of what? Of love, respect, honor, appreciation for being my parents. Huh? And what do they call it, Ali? Parents' Day. I've never heard that one before. Is that a new one, is it? <laughs> You've put a new innovation to the list, have you? Okay, so we have to add it to the book, inshallah. <laughs> parents Day, I've never heard, sorry about that. Is it true about Parents Day? <laughs> <laughs> what do they call it? Father's Day, Mother's Day, Balud Day, Satanic Day. They call it Father's Day or Mother's Day. But in Islam, is that correct? What do you reckon? What do you give your Mother's Day or mother on, last, on, her last, on her last Mother's Day? No idea. No idea? You didn't give her anything? Poor mother, why? <laughs> don't you love your mother? Every day. So why don't you, why don't you give her anything? Uh, obey her. So you didn't give her anything for Mother's Day? No Why not? I don't say Aha! Uh -huh, that's the answer I want. <laughs> don't get yourself all confused and ambiguous. <clears throat> because we do not celebrate Mother's Day. And the answer is, every single day of the year, not the year only, but your life. <clears throat> Whether your mother is alive, or your mother or your father is alive or dead, you must celebrate Mother's or Father's Day. In per se, as they say. Every day in Islam of your life, whether they are alive or they are dead, we respect, appreciate, and honor our mother and our father. Did you know that you remain a child to your parents until when? Who can tell me this? Huh? No. So you're not, after 17, 18, you're no longer a child? The question is, I repeat it. To you dies the answer. <laughs> you remain a child to your parents until the day of your demise. Until your, the day that you enter the grave. Whether your parents are alive and dead, you're their child. And respect, appreciation, honor must be every day for them. If they're dead, how can you honor your parents and respect them? Making dua for them giving charity on their behalf, and the things that are allowed in Islam, correct? So you always respect them, always honor them, always appreciate them, every day that you are living. Not that they are living, that you are living. You know, there is a modern trend today that has arisen where parents to the majority are looked at as a reliability, correct? due to their old age and physical weakness. They are looked at as a reliability, you know, as a burden, in other words. Someone hard to take care of. So what do they do, the majority of non-Muslims? But it has creeped into the Muslims as well. Where do they place these two old, good creatures? In an old people's home. They throw them. They chuck them in an old people's home. Evil, disgusting, wicked children they are. Shrugging your parents, shrugging the responsibility of your old parents, Wallahi serves as an invitation to Jahannam, to hellfire. Did you understand that? Shrugging abandoning the caretaking, the maintenance, the love and affection of being around your parents because of their old age can lead you in the doors of hellfire. The time your parents need you most is when? When they're old. They need you most. Wallahi, when you put them in your care and love them and be gentle to them and love them. At that time, 
It is the easiest way to attain Allah's pleasure. It is the easiest way to attain paradise. And the hadith says, He is doomed, he is doomed, he is doomed. I said, Ya Rasulullah, who is doomed? He said, the one, the person whose parents, whether one of them or both of them, attain old age during his life and does not enter Jannah. What does that mean? MTS? Why is he doomed? When one of his parents, or both of his parents, attained old age during his life, this child's life, but does not enter paradise. Why? Think about it. It's a very, very important statement, and many, many Muslims have not understood this. Have, they have no desire in wanting to know this. Don't care. SubhanAllah. This is an invitation to hell. An invitation to paradise. It can work either way. Why is this person doomed? Huh? Because of his old parents. Because of what reason? He enters hellfire. Why? Take care. Huh? Take care. Take care. Take care. Because he abandoned the parents at old age. He left them to rot. Did not look after them. Did not care for them. Wanted to just get rid of their maintenance. Give it to someone else. Yeah, ya akhti al-aziz. When you were a baby, who took care of you? Who read you? Who loved you? Who changed your nappies? Who stayed up the night for you? Years after you were born. And now that they're old, you're shrugging away those good, old, obedient parents of yours that took care of you when you were a baby, that carried you for at least nine months, kicking and turning, playing soccer inside her. You know, a lot of babies that play soccer, the mother probably eats a lot of wheat mix. You know, cereals and all that. So what happens here is the child, in return, gets the wheat mix into him and they start playing, you know, soccer inside her, football. Kicking and doing this and doing that. So when your wife next to you at night time says, Oof! Ouch! Ouch! So what's going on? You know, you wake up in a stuttle. You say, oh, I just got a kick from my child. Okay, inshallah. You have to wake me up for it. <laughs> so basically, after all that, you chuck them in an old people's home. Is that right? Absolutely not. I'll give you a beautiful hadith, which will end this section, this number two commandment. And I'm pretty sure you've all heard of this narration. It's the famous hadith of the young companion by the name of Al Qamah. Who's heard this hadith? You know Al Qamah? You all know Al Qamah? You know all know Madonna? We know her very well, don't we? Michael Jordan? Michael Jackson? Do we know Al Qamah? Allahu Alam who is. That's the, that's the situation of this Ummah. The young companion Al Qamah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him was extremely devout to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He worshipped Allah so strongly. A lot of prayers, a lot of zakat, and a lot of siyam, fasting. One day he became very ill, very ill. So his mother, sorry, his wife, Alkama's wife, rushed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, Alkama is on his deathbed. On his what? On the brink of death. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Bilal and Ammar, the two great powerful companions, and said to them, have al repeat the shahada before he dies. Atta, the declaration of faith. So Ammar and Bilal rushed to al and indeed they saw him in the agony of death on the brink of death. They said, Ya Alqama, say la ilaha illallah. This hadith you find in At-Tabarani and Ahmad. They said, Ya Alqama, 
Say La ilaha illallah. Al Kama was known for his worship, he was devout. He was a devout worshiper of Allah Ta'ala. But when they asked him to utter the declaration, his tongue froze. What happened? His tongue froze. It is as though you have tied it up, could not say anything. Could speak everything else, but could not utter La ilaha illallah. So the companions were sort of shocked. What is the problem of al -Kama? He was known for his worship. They rushed back to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, he is unable to utter the declaration of faith. So Rasulullah asked them one question. Is either of his parents alive? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, his mother is alive, but she is very old. She is what? Very old. He said, go to her immediately and ask her if she is able to come to Rasulullah. And if she is not, I shall go and see her quickly. So they went to her. Who went to her? Bilal and her? And Ammar. They said, Ya'um Alakama, the situation is ABC. Are you able to go to Rasulullah? She said, it will be my pleasure to go to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So an old lady, she stood up leaning on her walking stick Old lady, could not move around could not maneuver so much She went slowly to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam When she reached him, she said Assalamu Alaika Ya Rasulullah Greatness to you, O Prophet, O Messenger of Allah he replied to her, Wa alayki salam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sit down, Ya Um al -Kama. And then he said to her this important question, Ya Um al -Kama, tell me the truth. For otherwise Allah will reveal the truth to me. He immediately told her what? I'm no ordinary man. I'm Rasulullah. You either speak the truth or the truth will be revealed to me. In other words, wahi from Allah Ta'ala. He said to her, what is the situation with who? Her son. Who is her son? What is the situation of al -Kama? She knows best of him. He, she said, Ya Rasulullah, he prays a lot. He spends a great amount in charity. He fasts a great deal. And she stopped. Then he said to her, and yourself? What did he ask her, Nazbi? And yourself? What do you mean by yourself? What does that mean? How is Al Kama towards you? She said, I am angry with him. Listen carefully. She said, I am angry with him. He asked her, why, Ya Um Al Kama? What has he done? He has, he has preferred his wife over me. And thus he has disobeyed me. What was the reason? He has preferred who? Over his mother. And he has disobeyed her. And then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Surely it is your anger towards him. Why he is unable to pronounce the shahada. Then he turned to Bilal. Who turned to Bilal? Who? Who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And said, listen carefully, it's not the end of the story. Ya Bilal, go and collect me, for me, a quantity of firewood. Of what? Firewood. Now Umar al upon hearing this was like shocked, scared. Ya Rasulullah, and what do you plan to do with this firewood? I will burn him in front of your eyes. What did he say to her? I will burn him in front of your eyes. But Ya Rasulullah, she said, he is my son and my heart cannot bear that you burn him in front of me. Listen to what he says now. 
يجي يقوم على الكما The punishment of Allah, the fire of Allah is more lasting and more severe. Subhanallah. Do we understand what he's saying here? Do we understand, my brothers and sisters, what he means, what he is saying, what this is really telling us as an ummah? And what did she do then? Before that, he said, Wallahi, by the one in whose hand is my soul, all his prayers, his fasting, his zakat, will not avail him while you are angry with him. Immediately upon hearing this, she turned to her. Um Alkama, what she do? She turned to Allah. She did not want to see her son burn, be punished or fire. She turned to Allah and said, Ya Allah, bear witness. Bear witness that I have forgiven Alkama and that I am pleased with him now. What you say? That I have forgiven Alkama and what? And I am pleased with him now. Then Rasulullah said to Bilal, quickly go and see if Alkama is able to utter the shahada. For maybe, this is what he said, for maybe Um Alkama is saying it for my sake. So I want to burn him. Because she could be saying it for his sake. For Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So Bilal quickly rushed and as soon as he entered the door of where Alkama was staying, before he even saw him, he heard him say, La ilaha illallah. Subhanallah. Immediately. And then Bilal remarked, Bilal said, concerning this, this, this situation, it is true that the Alkama's tongue was tied, was captivated, was imprisoned when his mother was angry with him. But now she is pleased with him. His tongue has been released. Subhanallah. And he died. And he died. Can you imagine that? The last words were La ilaha illallah. And he died. When his mother was pleased, and she said that I have forgiven him, he could say immediately La ilaha illallah. And he died after that. What is this telling us? Think, brothers and sisters, think about this. What is this actually teaching us as Muslims, as slaves of Allah, as those who desire Jannah, Al Firdaus? What is it teaching us? This act was there as an example for us all to understand and reflect and ponder and implement to warn us about being disobedient to the mothers in particular, and the fathers. It's warning us. What, you think Alkama, it happened out of the blue? Allah Ta'ala made him an example for all of us. Because when things happen like this, there were reasons behind it. It is for an example for all of this Ummah. And as soon as she said, I am pleased, he uttered the declaration of salvation. Then the Rasul Muhammad sallam, he commanded that Alkama be washed and shrouded and then he buried him himself, prayed over him before he buried him and then he stood over his grave and said, indeed, whoever favors or prefers his wife over his mother, then Allah, the angels and all people their curse will be upon him. And then he said, amongst many, the end of it he said, for indeed Allah's anger is due to his mother's anger and Allah's pleasure is due to his mother's pleasure. So let us reflect. There, are so, there is so much we can talk about regarding shirk, obedience to parents, but this is just a touch of the surface. Wallahi, no more than a touch of the surface. You know, one of the, one of the companions, 
was asked by a tabi'i. He asked, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, if I carry my mother around the tawaf, you know, what they call a piggyback, huh? would that be suffice as an obedient to her that I've done my duty? What did he want to do this tabi'i? To do what? Carry his mother on his back while doing tawaf. So he was asking the leader of the, or the commander of the faithful, is that a suffice action for the obedience to my mother? Is that enough? He goes, Wallahi, that will not suffice one contraction that she did with you. One contraction. Not even suffice that. So you can see the importance of Islam and the love and affection and obedience and gentleness to our mothers. We'll leave it at that inshallah ta'ala and we want to ask some questions because today was a Q&A. It wasn't supposed to be the continuation but alhamdulillah alladhi khalaq as samawati wal ard there is a, uh, a large quantity so we desired otherwise. Yes Muhammad. If let's say our parents are non-Muslims, they're angry for us for being Muslims. So... <laughs> Muhammad is asking a good question, but the question was actually answered throughout my talk. He's asking, what if the parents are non-Muslims, kafar in other words, and she is angry, he is angry that you have become a Muslim. Okay, continue. So what's the question? What yes, happens? now... What happens, I mean, you know, you're, you're disobedient. What did, the had, what did the hadith say? Okay. What did it say? It's so long you follow his commands. Huh? It's so long you obey his commands. You are commanded, even if they're non-Muslims, be careful here, to obey your parents in that which is lawful. But you are not allowed to, com to obey whether Muslim or non-Muslim parents when they are commanding you to evil. Wallahi, I've actually noticed today that are many non-Muslim parents are better towards their Muslim children than the Muslim parents are to their Muslim children. Have you noticed that? They respect them more than the Muslim parents respect their children in this area. You know, as happened to Abu Bakr, she asked that she went one day to Muhammad and said, Ya Rasulullah, her parents were non-Muslim at that time, her mother and father. Asma, Aisha's mother and father. Aisha's mother was coming to Asma to see her in Mecca. She said, Ya Rasulullah, she's a non-Muslim, she's a pagan. What is my duty towards her? He said to her, a duty of a daughter to the mother does not change. Be obedient to her, respect her in that which is right. Even if she was a non-Muslim, you respect and you honor your parents. The only time, you know, you want her to be a Muslim, don't you? You want him to be a Muslim, don't you? Hey, is that going to happen if you shut him off? It will never happen. Islam is built on ethics and morals. It's built on character, excellent character. So if you show your parents, your non-Muslim parents, so, you know, an abnormality in behavior, they're going to think Islam is a deen or a religion of, of mischief, of evil, disrespect and dishonor. So no, you take care of your parents. You treat them with honor, appreciation and respect. And you show them dignity because they are still your parents. The only time that you do not obey them is when they command you to disobey Allah Ta'ala. Bitch. No. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, you have clearly uh, explained the importance and how we can put our parents, especially our mother. Uh, what, can you explain how we should treat our step parents? Very good question, Tabarakallah. I'm a very wise man, young man. The question is. What is our duty towards our step-parents? 
Who's a step parent, Mikhail? What does step parents mean? Explain it. Who becomes or who is a stepmother or stepfather? When can that be? You can have a stepsister, you can have a stepbrother, you can have a stepmother and stepfather, correct? When is that person become step? <laughs> it's a step, you see. Because they step somewhere to become something. Correct? That's what step means in reality. It's like climbing a ladder. So when is it? Very good. That's a good answer. When one remarries and he's not your true mother or she is not your true father or he is not your true father. So they become your step parents, whether one or the other. Now, exactly as you do to your parents, you do to your step parents. You treat them with respect, honor, and dignity. But, I say, but they are, they will never, ever be exchanged to your or for your real parents. Understand this. Your step parents can never be in place uh, from your real mother or your real father. They can never be the same. Ever, ever be the same. So what we've got to understand is we respect them, we honour them, and we appreciate them with love, gentleness, because they're taking care of you as well. But don't forget who really brought you up and nurtured you when you were a baby and before you were even a baby. Now, any other questions? Parents? Likewise, exactly the same scenario, you respect them. But they're never ever the same as the, your parents. No one takes their place. You can never ever have equal status as your parents, ever. But you respect your mother and father-in-law. You treat them with respect and appreciation and dignity and honour. But they never ever become equal on the same pedestal as your real parents, your biological parents. Now, Sorry? For the wife, how would it work? For the wife? Yeah. In other words, what is her duty? Yeah. In which sense? Give me an example. Uh, my wife has a double parents. Right? Correct. Uh, what's the obligation towards me? Is it? Your wife must obey you in that which is right. The wife must obey the husband in that which is right. She is not allowed to obey the husband in that which is wrong. I'll give you an example. When you take the trust of a woman to be your wife, as soon as she leaves her father's home, she becomes under your obligation. You feed her, you clothe her, you shelter her, you love her, you show affection and gentleness towards her. You treat her with uttermost respect, integrity and honour. Correct? If her father says to her, I want you to come for dinner on Friday night. You, the husband, says, no, I don't want you to go. We are not going. She has to obey you. You understand that? She does not obey her husband in this situation or her mother in this situation. So the obligation falls under whom? The father, the husband, not the father. Once you've taken the trust, the responsibility from the father, it goes to the husband. Faham? Now, Habib. There's a hypothetical question here. Uh -huh. uh, in the historical mother, where the sperm comes from man and put uh, you know, in the lady's room, sure. she's the historical mother and the father. Who's the father? The father is the one who donates the sperm. In the modern time, but the person is when he's born becomes a Muslim. Well, what is uh... the question? What we asked is a very good question, actually. The question that we should ask: Are we allowed to induce a woman, a Muslim woman, with sperms that are not from the husband? 
The question is, so is the English, is the woman, the Muslim woman, allowed to accept the injection of a sperm that is not her husband? No. Not acceptable. That is not acceptable in Islam. So that nullifies the situation completely regarding the question. Let us say it does happen. Then the other question comes where a lady, for example, is raped. Correct? And she carries or conceives, becomes pregnant. Is she allowed to abort the child? What do the scholars think? They said yes in the first three months. Well, Who said yes in the first three months? What, what, I heard, <laughs> what, I what about your opinion, Nazari? Would you allow, for example, a female relative under your responsibility to abort the child from rape? The strongest or the most preponderant opinion after full analysis in this area is once pregnancy is positive, you are not allowed to touch a child. And we are going to look at that further, inshallah. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ مِنْ إِمْلَاك Do not kill your children because of poverty. We will have a look at that, inshallah ta'ala, touch on it a little bit in our coming lesson. And that will be the third commandment. Whether we are allowed or whether we are not allowed, and what the scholars have said very briefly, in a nutshell, because there's a lot, a lot spoken about it, but with little evidence. And just briefly, the scholars have said, one opinion is that you are allowed to abort in the first three months. Some said the first 120 days, the first four months. While others have said, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنِ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Once pregnancy is positive, leave that child. Come not near that child. Killing that child is killing a human being. Even though the soul has not yet been blown into the womb. <coughs> because when the, the semen, when they meet together, the sperm, what happens? It's still, when it works, when it's positive, it becomes a little flesh of blood. And yet the soul is not blown into this. So some scholars have said that at this time, due to a lifeless entity or essence, you are allowed to carry out a miscarriage. You are allowed to abort the child. But the reality of the matter is, once they've met, the life has initiated. Otherwise, there'll be no meeting. Once this has met, the reality of the matter is, life has begun. And, wallahu a'lam, the most predominant, preponderant opinion is, don't touch that soul. Don't touch that life. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll have a look at that in the future. Let us say, our beloved brother was asking the question, we haven't completed it yet. Pregnancy has occurred. She's kept a child. He's a child of rape, of illicit intercourse. What happens to the child? Or he could be a child of haram sexual behavior, correct? What happens to the child? The father is known, he is recognized. What happens to that child? It's the mother's child. Isn't it? Yes. He is attributed to the mother. The father that committed the haram is not his real father. Not even considered his father. The child in this area is attributed to the mother. Is it understood? And inshallah ta'ala, yes, he becomes a Muslim, strengthen him, he's like any other child. He's an innocent soul. It's not his fault or her fault that what happened, happened. 
and the poor fella in reality is like an orphan. He becomes like an orphan. He has got no father. And that is the reality of Islam. Alhamdulillah. That is to warn us against any illicit sexual behavior. Naam Nazmi. Say again. Yeah, in terms of the hadith about coming to prevent that happening. I'll come again. Yeah, how do we balance between the mother and the wife? When does the wife have her right and the mother has her right? Very good question. When a mother tells you, even a father, tells you to do something that is lawful. I'll give you an example. Your mother tells you, Nazvi, can you please, basic example, but it's proper. Go and purchase for me a couple of kilos of apples. Correct? What did she say to you? Your mother? What did she say to you? Go purchase some apples. Okay. Your wife comes, no. I don't want you to go and purchase all the time apples, apples, apples. Because understand something, that is our natu natural behavior. The worst person to the daughter or the wife is her mother-in-law. Did you know that? 99% of the time. The worst person to the wife is her mother-in-law. They have so much combat. They're like two enemies. They always fight each other. Nitty gritty naggy baggy fussy. All the time. Always fighting each other. Correct? You guys married? You're not married yet? Be careful, huh? <laughs> so, what happens, Nazvi? Your wife will say to you, again? She told you she wants this yesterday. She always wants this and that and this and that. I don't want you to go and get her two kilos of apples. What do you do? You say, I'm sorry, wife, with all respect. Fear Allah. This is my mother. She needs this, and I'm going to get this for her. But there are men who are not men, they are males. Ah, oh, sorry, my wife, sorry, yes, whatever you say, sorry, sorry. Well, on the other hand, your mother is there, cursing you, angered by your actions, and the wrath of Allah Ta'ala, A'udhu Billah, is bestowing upon you. Because you are, no, sorry, wife, sorry, 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 whatever you say. It's in your hands. You're my boss, you're my leader, you're my commando. You're my Amir, you're my Imam, you're my Shaykh. You're my Malik and you're this and you're that. You put her, I want to put her up like this. And your mother, you put her down, you trample her. Get that example? Is that enough or? Your parents are very disrespectful against you in Islam, you know. Do, you know, sometimes it, you know, it, it, it offends you in some sense, you know. They are, they are, they are Look. Muhammad, I understand where you're coming from because Alhamdulillah, Tabarakallah, Allah has blessed you with the really deen of salvation and light. He has bestowed upon you the, the only deen that is accepted by him. May Allah keep you strong, inshaAllah ta'ala. Definitely, your relatives are going to pressure you. They're going to offend you. They're going to insult you. They're going to criticize you. They're going to defame you. They're going to call you A, B, C, D, E, F, G to Z. Correct? Are you a Muslim? Alhamdulillah. Have you got full faith? Alhamdulillah. Patience is a virtue. What is that? You know your return back to them? Thank you. As Muslims, we are ethical and we're more behaved, well behaved people. We don't use our tongue to slander like you do to me. You want to commit evil to me? No problem. I do not do it to you. Be patient. And you will be the winner, inshallah ta'ala. Oh Allah, forgive them. Oh Allah, be patient with them. Oh Allah, guide them to Islam. Easy. I'm not going to help you. You know what I mean? They shout at you and you shout back at them like a lion roaring. Is it going to benefit? Is it going to benefit? You know, for example, if a lion is in front of you, the kid of the jungle, right in front of your eyes, going to just devour you any second. Are you going to be of any benefit to sit down and start roaring like him? He'll eat you, correct? The more you roar, the more he will laugh at you. 
You're not a challenge to him. Patience. You're going to die, you're going to die anyway. But regarding these people, they're going to roar and shout and this and that. Alhamdulillah. You say what? Alhamdulillah. It's not. What did I say? The saying, the sticks and stones don't break your bones? Is that a true statement? Yeah. And words never hurt me. Yeah, that's exactly right. You do exactly as the brother said. My Allah, you know, Allah like guide them to Islam. Allah, you know, bestow upon them your guidance and so forth. Because it's not going to be of any benefit to retaliate with a severe reprisal. Kabich? Alhamdulillah. Naam, Habibi. I know that parents have rights over, over their children, but do the children have rights over their parents? That's our next lesson, inshallah. I mean, uh, I ask, I give you an example. Like, for example, uh, okay, you just explained about a non Muslim parents, but in a situation where, for example, say the father doesn't pray five times and his tawheed is not that strong, like he involves in astrology and stuff like that. Sure. But the children are very, uh, mashallah, religious. And sure. So in that case, are they, is, is it their responsibility to convince the parents until they are convinced or they just the... You do, I know, I know where you're coming from and what you're getting at and that's a situation today very, very rampant where the parents are always the right ones and you can never be right as a child. And that's a common, it's a phenomenon out there worldwide. What your situation is, if you see benefit in doing that with your parents, then do it. Keep on doing it. But if you see that by you doing da'wah to them, it's causing them to be more evil towards you or to Islam, stop it. You get the, it's a balance thing now, as I said. You continue doing da'wah to them and never stop in a well, wise, fair way. But when you see that by you doing da'wah to your parents, it's going to cause them to go or be more evil. Stop. Understand? Sheikh, are you allowed to compromise when it comes to like situations where there's like a difference in opinion or they follow a different opinion? Like, for example, if they force you to go like to a uh, mixed wedding or they talk. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Because here the hadith says you cannot obey your parents or anyone else when it means you've said being Allah Taala. So these are things that are haram in Islam. They have a different understanding. There's no different understanding here. Islam is straight. It's not like this wiggly. It's not a zigzag. It's what? Straight. Where in Islam does it allow us to be in a mingling state? Chucking parties and all that. Is there a difference of opinion there? Absolutely not. Where in Islam does shaving the beard say it's, there's a confusion or there's a difference of opinion? There is no difference of opinion in that situation. Normally, like, they don't have the knowledge, they just say it's sunnah. Well, you have the knowledge. You have the knowledge and you know it's an obligation to grow the beard. For example, as you said, knowing that it's an obligation, you cannot obey them. You disobey in Allah Ta'ala. Anything that is absolute and there's no difference of opinion in it, in matters like this, there is no obedience to anyone when it comes when it comes to these issues. Understand? Now, uh, Habib. My question is that you mentioned that in the case where someone condemns the wife that uh, I have to buy two kids, two kids of okay. the mother. And previously that you mentioned that when the, wife, when the father calls the daughter to redeem, the, the wife should obey the husband. Correct. Uh, what is the ruling that the woman is like, sort of supposed to obey the husband over the father after marriage and the husband is still allowed to obey the parents and not uh, listen to his wife? Different, er, different scenario. The wife, when she goes into the husband's life, house, it becomes his obligation. Totally. Because the man is the one that has the upper hand in provisional status. The wife doesn't. Does the wife have to supply food for the house? No. Shelter the house? No. Does she have to provide anything else for the house? Does she pay anything for the house? No. She doesn't have to. A woman, a wife, is not obligated under any circumstance to provide anything for the house. 
There's no obligation on her. She could, she could own a million ringgit and she's got it in her drawer and the husband is struggling. He's still obligated and she does not have to spend one ringgit to that extent. So there's a big difference here. The wife is the caretaker. Not the, the husband is the caretaker, not the wife. So they've got different positions here. You're going to pray or we're going to continue? One more, huh? Question about shirk. About shirk. Some people are asked to wear ambulance gear, wristband, or string, whatever. They talk about shirk and they say, no, it's uh, the wrong word unless you pray to Allah. It's actually Allah's. Uh, uh, we've signed a few surahs, Allah being the word not their back. How do you. How do you what is the reason for their wearing that? Do you say in the wrist? They say wear this and you say you, no, you cannot pick it. So. What is the reason for wearing it? Inna al amalu bin niyat. All actions are by intention. So what is the reason for wearing that, uh, that wrist string or bangle or whatever you want to call it? They, they don't think they can answer. Huh? Well, we can't answer the question. <laughs> You gotta have a reason for it. When you when I do something, I wear if people wear it for beautification. Not that it's right for men, but they do wear it. A lady's allowed to wear it. Now that's another reason. That's a reason now. Now you change the whole scenario. You've made it upside down now. You've tipped it. There is a reason, which is for protection. That's a chilic in essence. Is it not? It is, yeah. I know that people they don't they say no, it's only Allah because they're confusing themselves and contradicting themselves. Tell them to fear Allah and remove it. For when a man came to Muhammad and he was wearing something similar to it, he goes, Ya Rajul, why are you wearing this? He said, to overcome the weakness of old age. He said, to remove it for only increase your weakness. And then he said to him, if you were to die with that on your wrist, you will not prosper. Give me this hadith. Do you know what hadith is? Probably not. Inshallah, we'll leave it to the following lesson. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa akhu da'wan. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضى من غير خوف وحنين والأحزاب تشد القائد أعلى المسدد نبينا هادي محمد في روحه عزم